Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the American Society for Microbiology and our evening series, Microbes After Hours, where we bring to you speakers from all over the country who can introduce you to the latest and greatest uh, research that's going on in the area of microbiology. We have those of you who are here in the room. We also have a virtual audience online. Hello, online audience. And hello, audience of the future, because these will be archived on the Microbe World site. So if you're watching this from 2040 and you're trying to figure out when the bioeconomy really took off, it was tonight. <laughs> So tonight we are talking about um, Rumpelstiltskin and the ability to turn straw into gold. And microbes can do that. And um, there are tremendous opportunities for using uh, agricultural byproducts and using microbes to turn those byproducts into uh, chemicals, into fuels, into um, pharmaceuticals, all kinds of products that we need and that, uh, that microbes are perfectly capable of taking care of for us. So we have two wonderful speakers tonight. I'm going to introduce the first one now. And we're very honored to have with us tonight the director of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, which is the agriculture's equivalent of the National Institutes of Health. Someday maybe we'll have that kind of budget. Uh, not yet, but this is, the, this is the part of the USDA that funds extramural research. Um, Dr. Ramaswamy uh, was appointed by President Obama to direct the NIFA uh, in 2012. He came to NIFA from Oregon State University. He has a, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a PhD in entomology, <laughs> which is not microbiology. But we all know now that insects all depend on their microbes. So we welcome you as an honorary microbiologist. Um, he uh, has many honors and awards in his, uh, on his CV. I'll just mention a few of them. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He's a fellow of the Entomolo Entomological Society of America and a distinguished graduate alumnus of Cook College, Rut Rutgers University. Sunny? appreciate it. Thanks very much and much appreciated and, and thank you for having me here uh, this evening. Uh, so I, you know, Roland, who was sitting next to me here in the front, asked me uh, if I was a microbiologist. I said, no, I'm not. I'm a macrobiologist, I said to him. But I guess maybe I should have said to him, man, uh, that, uh, you know, one of my, I hired a guy named uh, Ludwig Zurich several years ago when I was in Kansas. And he is a, a, a microbiologist, and he told me all organisms, all animals, all multicellular organisms, are all they are are bags of uh, microbes. And so I guess uh, insects are also bags of microbes. And in fact, I, I've always claimed that insects are like little cows, you know, and cockroaches, which is what I worked on for my PhD, are little like little cows. They do have a ruminant stomach, which is in the first part of the intestine called the ileum. And so that's where they house the uh, the flagellates and other microbes in there to break down various cellulosic and hemicellulosic and lignin type compounds as well. So indeed you're right. I mean without microbes would all be uh, in, a, in terribly bad shape as it were. I don't think uh, the, the sort of evolution that we've seen on earth would have occurred without the involvement of microbes in, uh, in helping organisms move along as it were over the many many millions and billions of years uh, in evolution. So uh, I wanted to, you know, so the, the topic is uh, microbiology of the bioeconomy. And as I said to Ann Lichens Park, my colleague, who is a bona fide certified uh, microbiologist, and uh, uh, she works in the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. And as I said to uh, Ann, I might go ahead and throw the words uh, bacteria and other microbes in here once or twice in the comments that I'm going to make. I've got about, I think, 10 minutes or something like that. And then she's going to, Ann's going to start waving, saying, I've got uh, five minutes and three minutes, et cetera, so that the next speaker will have enough to, or there's a Q&A session as well, I think, after I'm uh, done. So the bioeconomy. And you know, I think I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, uh, I take exception to Ann's comment that the bioeconomy is getting rolled out today. Actually, the word bioeconomy has been bandied about for several years uh, uh, in, in multiple different places. 
And in fact, I, although I'm an entomologist by training, as you've uh, learned, uh, I started using the word bioeconomy about uh, uh, six, uh, seven years ago. And in fact, we put together a, uh, a compelling argument to get one billion dollars, billion with a B, dollars, uh, to realize the potential of the bioeconomy. And in many ways, I think, I truly think that the 20th century has been the petroleum economy and that the 21st century is going to be the bioeconomy in, in many ways. And I think in large measure is going to be the work of microbiologists that's going to help us real, realize that potential of the bioeconomy itself. And the bioeconomy, I mean, you know, it's a word that's been, you know, developed in the recent past. It's been around for a very long time. And in fact, anything and everything that we do, uh, particularly in the food and agricultural, um, food, agriculture, natural resources enterprise, literally is contributing to the bioeconomy, as also the kind of work that's done in the biomedical area as well. All of these are contributing to the bioeconomy. In fact, if you look at just the food and agricultural enterprise, uh, we've got, uh, if you think of the farm gate value, this is the value of when the farmer or the rancher raises his or her crops and his livestock and it's going to be sold. That's called the farm gate value. That farm gate value is only about $275 billion in the United States. With a B, billion with a B. Only 275. But then when you take that material and go ahead and process it, and that doesn't, by the way, doesn't even include uh, the forestry uh, commodities in there. So when you take that $275 billion worth of agricultural commodities, go ahead and process it and store it and transport it and then bring it to your dinner table, it ends up becoming about a $2.7 trillion enterprise. So there's an incredible tenfold increase in the value. And a lot of that increase in value is because we are taking various types of agricultural commodities and, you know, in this you can also imagine forestry commodities as well, and manipulating the structure of that and ultimately to be able to get new structures, as it were, that you can go ahead and utilize that, whether as food or as the fuel that goes into your automobile. Uh, these are the kinds of structures that we can create from uh, these, uh, what I like to call as macro arrays that are grabbing solar energy, uh, as in plants, that is, and, and other photosynthetic organisms. And these macro arrays can then go ahead and take, uh, you know, uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide and water, and with the energy that you get, they receive from uh, solar uh, for radiation, they're able to make uh, this unbelievable uh, uh, pharmaco pharmacopoeia of. Uh, amazing chemistries as it were and then we've tried to you know utilize those chemistries to develop all manner of additional value added products and so this is everything from uh, the plastics that we can think of and in fact coca-cola company is uh, now starting to sell their coke in uh, bio-derived plastic bottles and in fact uh, here in the next two years in the United States all Coca-Cola products that are going to be sold, liquid products that are going to be in these bio-derived products. And these bio-derived products, by the way, are the result of microbial uh, fermentation that uh, uh, converts these uh, polymers in plants, particularly in, in various types of uh, uh, grain like corn and other uh, uh, species, into polylactic acid and from polylactic acid to other value-added products as well. So we've got those sorts of things that have been going on now for several years. So it, is, it really is, the bioeconomy really is a very huge enterprise. And in that bioeconomy, you can think of all manner of things. I mean, everything from uh, these plastics that I talked about to ready to burn fuels. And, and uh, in fact, just uh, the Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, is going to North Carolina in a couple of days to uh, announce Domtar. Some of you that listen to NPR uh, will hear about Domtar, the uh, oh gosh, I forgot. It's a paper company, and there's a particular word, the adjective that they use uh, about that paper company. You know, Domtar, D-O-M-T-A-R. Domtar has figured out how to take lignin from you know for the last few years in terms of the bioeconomy, genetic plant geneticists have been trying to figure out how to get rid of lignin because it makes. Uh, 
the accessibility to hemicellulose and cellulose to convert to value-added products, very difficult. It's lignin that's uh, the, the challenging component within these plant materials, so you can't readily convert hemicellulose and cellulose into um, uh, alcohols and other value-added products. And so breeders have been trying to figure out how to get rid of the lignin, but Domtar has, with funding that we provided, the, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture provided, they've figured out how to take that with microbial action, convert that actually into drop-in liquid fuels as we were talking about. In fact, they're going to be opening a plant that the Secretary is going to be uh, uh, dedicating in a couple of days in, in North Carolina. So those are the kinds of things that are happening in terms of drop-in fuels. It's not just taking um, sugars and converting them to ethanol and in fact the fermentation of sugars into ethanol we've known now actually ever since almost humans invented uh, agriculture humans invented agriculture in multiple parts of the world uh, starting about 10 to 15 thousand years ago and uh, so we've known how to make ethanol and that's the technology that's been around for a very long time but going beyond that uh, as to other value added chemicals as well that we're thinking of uh, indeed using microbial approaches, I, I truly think that we're going to be able to drive the DuPonts and the Dow Chemicals and other companies as well that we've got in, in America and in the world as well. In addition to that, we've all, you can also think of uh, uh, tailored food products to meet specialized dietary requirements. You can think of personalized medicine, uh, particularly in the form of uh, uh, you know the the use of uh, functional genomics and personal genomics to create these personalized medical approaches again that's a component of the the bioeconomy itself and on top of it utilizing microbes as biosensors to be able to for example detect the presence of uh, uh, various types of uh, 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 environmental chemicals various types of environmental perturbations uh, various types of approaches that the microbes might go ahead and self-report saying that you know feed me or water me or whatever else that the plants need to be doing or the animals need to be doing as well we're close to being able to realize the potential that microbes offer us in in allowing us to have these sentinels and these sensors being deployed as well again we've provided funding for that the National Institute for Agriculture and the National Science Foundation and NIH have provided funding for that kind of work as well so there are some really unbelievable opportunities in the uh, in the bioeconomy area. There are three areas that I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of uh, additional work that's needed and offers opportunities for scientists and, and other and, and companies as well, for that matter, is in the area of uh, continued uh, in the area of genetic engineering, uh, DNA sequencing, and also in high throughput methods as well that we need to be developing. We're, we're, we've barely scratched the surface, as it were, in realizing the potential of what the bio economy is going to be offering us in being able to utilize these renewable agricultural and forestry commodities. So in the bioeconomy blueprint, how many of you read the bioeconomy blueprint that came out last year? Okay, a couple of three people in the audience. So uh, if you were to Google bioeconomy blueprint, you will get this uh, uh, document and I would encourage you to go ahead and read this document. It was actually released just about a year ago, um, about uh, the month of uh, April of last year. And it lays for our nation a path forward, as it were, a roadmap on what we're going to be able to realize out of this, uh, the bioeconomy itself. For the United States, in terms of the bioeconomy, it's not just in the agricultural realm, but it also is in the biomedical realm as well. And in fact, a number of other countries have been looking at what the potential is for the bioeconomy. The Europeans, they think that it's going to be over one trillion euros. That's about one and a half trillion dollars. And uh, the Chinese are really uh, investing a significant amount of funding as well in this area. They're expecting their nation in the next about five to ten years to be hitting about 500 billion dollars worth of uh, uh, effort in the bioeconomy itself. So the United States is a leader, currently is a leader in this area, and will you know continue to uh, uh, lead. And it'll, so the bioeconomy blueprint refers to five areas one of which is to support research and development. Obviously, there's a tremendous amount of gains to be made as yet. In fact, uh, micro microbiologists are going to offer us those uh, transformative, game-changing approaches, and we're going to have to make investments in that area. Commercialization of innovations and discoveries is the second area that we've just barely scratched the surface. 
improving education and workforce training. In fact, uh, Anne and Anne and uh, I were standing outside and talking about uh, what will it take to go ahead and meet, meet these workforce needs. Just within the agricultural enterprise, just last year, last fall, there was a survey that was uh, developed and, and the results were released last fall that said that in the agricultural enterprise uh, in the next five years we'll have need for 50 need to fill 58,000 positions and we only have we're only graduating about 28,000 graduates in these disciplines so we're only we're less than half in being able to meet the needs that we've got. And so there's unbelievable opportunities for young people to get into these endeavors that will be supporting the bioeconomy. A fourth area is the, the, uh, the need to uh, enhance the partnerships between private enterprise and public enterprise as well. Uh, the public, i.e. the federal government and the state governments, do not have the deep pockets they used to. Anymore it's going to require a different kind of a partnership, which means that we're going to have to figure out how do you deal with patents? How do you deal with intellectual property? How do, who gets to keep what part of it? And uh, these are questions that have not been dealt with that will need to be dealt with as well. And then finally, the last part of it, particularly for people wanting to invest in these en enterprises, is the, the need for expedited and uh, 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 predictable regulations and policies as well. A lot of the companies that, a lot of people, venture capitalists for example, that are sitting on the sidelines waiting to see what's going to happen, is they don't know where all this is going to end up going. If they were to go ahead and make the investments, will they be sued by somebody, by Greenpeace or other organizations? They need to have a better sense of the regulations and policies as well. In terms of USDA and particularly the, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, we've got uh, a number of opportunities in, in developing uh, uh, new crops and, and new uh, animals as well, new uh, uh, breeds of animals as well. The, uh, the ability to restore uh, environmental degradation. The, uh, the other area is uh, in terms of biomonitors to, uh, to monitor pollution. Again, imagine the kinds of uh, contributions that microbiologists have already made and, and the kinds of contributions that we need as we go forward. A fourth area, fifth area is in the realm of synthetic biology. Synthetic biology and systems biology are areas that, in fact, in some ways, I think the microbiologists invented for us. And uh, again, we've barely scratched the surface. Again, within the synthetic biology area, we've got challenges in relation to regulations and policies as well. These are things that we need to be thinking about, not just doing the microbiology, and getting ahead of the social sciences as well. So what we need to be thinking of is the connectivity between the social sciences and the, and the uh, uh, microbiology and, and the other scientific disciplines as well. And, and finally, uh, the opportunities that it, uh, affords us, the bioeconomy affords us in terms of uh, exports. I think, you know, already we've got, uh, it's a huge enterprise for the United States. If you take that breadth of things from the agricultural all the way to the biomedical, we're talking about in terms of the jobs, in terms of the economic footprint, we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, three to four trillion dollars of our economy is attributable to this bioeconomy. And so microbiology is going to play a very, very critical role in this. The last thing I wanted to share with you, uh, I've got a whole bunch of examples that I got as well in terms of where we're investing right now. The last thing is in terms of the RFAs, the request for applications that we're going to be putting out here in the near future. In the 2014 budget, we have uh, made a, a, a compelling argument to receive additional funding. Uh, so in the, in the President's budget, in the 2014 budget, if you go to our website, you'll be able to see it. We've been proposed to receive $383 million for the agriculture and Food Research Initiative. This is our flagship competitive grants program. That's a 30% increase in funding. So I hope all of you microbiologists are going to get your pencils ready or your computers ready to start, you know, putting those grant proposals together. Uh, Anne Lichens Park is here, and, and uh, she can tell you a lot more about the kinds of investments that we're going to be seeking or ideas we're going to be seeking. And, and this is in the, our AFRI foundational programs. Also, don't forget the small business innovation research programs are another opportunity for both academic scientists and others to be seeking funding as well. Thank you very much, and I, you know, I'm open for questions now. I think we'll take all the questions together at the end. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Could I just get a quick show of hands of how many people in the room um, studied microbiology in college? 
fair number. How many of you knew when you started on that microbiology course of study that one of the things you could do would be to uh, make biofuels? One, two? Uh, how many of you knew that if you took biology, chemistry, organic chemistry, physics, you could go to med school? <laughs> Everybody, right? So this, this is the, so we've just heard this incredible range of possibilities of what microbes can do um, in the agricultural sector and what kinds of industries could be based on microbial processes, but virtually no one starts college thinking, I like biology, I like microbiology, and thinks that they can have a career like that. Fortunately, we have with us tonight someone who has put a lot of effort into developing programs to help students make that transition and come out of, of school with the skills that they need to contribute to the bioeconomy. So I'm thrilled to introduce Joy Duran-Peterson. She is the founding director of the University of Georgia's Professional Science Master's Program in Biomanufacturing and Bioprocessing, where students learn what they need to know to, to go out into the economy and thrive in this kind of career. Um, she was also the founding director of the Biofuels, Biopower, and Biomaterials Initiative, which is now called the Bioenergy Systems Research Institute at UGA. Her research interests include biotechnology for biofuels and bioproducts development. But she also has a passion for being inspired by what nature already does. I, I was thinking about cockroaches and termites, and termites know how to turn wood into termites. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty amazing. Um, we would like to be able to do, I mean, I don't know really if we need more termites, but. Yeah, you get the idea. Um, nature has already figured out how to do a lot of things, and microbes have already figured out how to do practically every chemical transformation that uh, that humans have have uh, wanted to do. So um, that that, that uh, nature's inspiration has been important to Joy in her work, and I'm very happy to have her here to talk about training for the bioeconomy. So I'm very happy to be here, and I'm not an entomologist, but I study bugs. So, <laughs> so I'm the, the microbial metabolic engineer in the flyer that was sent out to you, and my contact information is there, and I'm happy to answer any questions if we don't have time for them at the end. Feel free to contact me. Um, please feel free to visit our website that's listed at the bottom. It's just biomanufacturing. I know it's a really long word, but it's just one word at uga.uga.edu. Um, so there's one sentence that was in this flyer that I thought was particularly intriguing, that microbiology is poised to make inroads towards reducing dependence on crude oil and petroleum-based products. And I have this lovely spaghetti slide, and you will be quizzed on all of the details of this later. But you'll see things like this where you see all these lines going every which way, and what they're showing is an illustration of how truly dependent we really are on petroleum. And it's not just liquid transportation fuels, as, as Sonny was alluding to. The chair you're sitting in, the clothes you're wearing, the shoes on your feet, probably the products that you used on your body. So we're really, really steeped into this as, as someone called our addiction, right? So to further illustrate this, I borrowed a slide from my friend, um, Dr. Brent Shanks, from the NSF Engineering Research Center for Biorenewable Chemicals. And it's a wonderful facility, also training scientists for this, this new bioeconomy. But if you take a look at this poor fellow, he's about to undergo some kind of surgical intervention here, and if you look at all of the equipment and all of the apparatus that are associated with his procedure, if you were to take everything away that is either petroleum-based or derived from some kind of petroleum intermediate, this is what you would have. <laughs> And I'm not even sure that, you know, you see the, the needle stuck in that septum. I'm not even sure you would have that. So you may have just the medicine all dripping down your arm. So, you know, picture's worth a thousand words. Really, really, we are a petroleum-based society. And I agree with 
the idea that hopefully we really are making this transition and some pioneers have been making this transition for a number of years and the rest of us are trying to catch up now right and we need everybody all y'all everybody and including young people right we need to push this forward because it has to happen and hopefully in our lifetimes and it's a matter of national security. This is the Secretary of the Navy, and he gave a really moving speech at the National Clean Energy Summit. And I'd just like to paraphrase some of his words because they're much better than anything I could put together. And he says it makes strategic sense to transition away from fossil fuels. And he said, you know, we wouldn't entrust some of the people that we buy our energy from to build our ships, to build our aircraft, to build our, our vehicles, our grand transportation. And yet, we're at their mercy to steer our ships, to fly our aircraft, to make sure our vehicles are operational because we rely on their fuel to run our equipment, right? And he also points out that there's the sticker shock so for every increase in a dollar of a barrel of oil, it costs just the U.S. Navy alone 31 million extra dollars. That's one dollar in the cost of a barrel of oil. And we all watch that go up and down all the time, right? So the third thing he says is that it's costly not just in dollars and cents, but if you think about Afghanistan, for example, for every 50 convoys of oil that we brought in, we lost a Marine killed or wounded. And this is the military finally stepping up to the plate and saying, look, this has got to stop. This is too expensive. That's just too high a price to pay. And then if you think about the environment, and it's a matter of environmental impact. And this is a, a picture, y'all probably seen this, and you've probably heard the debates about um, whether or not we're running out of oil. And if you read The Atlantic, there was a, a nice cover that I meant to bring with a smiley face dripping oil that we're not running out of oil. We're not running out of fossil fuels. But when you dig deeper into that article and when you really think critically about this, what you see is, okay, maybe we're not completely running out. Maybe it's not all going away, but at what cost to recover it? And what are we doing? And every single time we convert energy to something else or we try to create energy that's been stored, we do something to our planet. And that's true for biofuels, that's true for petroleum, but we're not looking at everything through the same lens, right? And this is, this is where we're starting to all get on the same page. So we've got environmentalists and the military kind of starting to sing the, sing the same song, right? And this is, this is something that's really important that a lot of people don't realize too, is that it's a matter of an economic reality. And this is a, a chart that I think you can see barely in the corner, New Energy Finance World Watch Institute. But this is annual investment in renewable energy worldwide, and this is in US billions of dollars. So if you look back around here, you know, we kind of danced around worldwide a little bit of investment. And then, oh, we started seeing increases and oh my goodness, about between 2002 and 2005, we saw a doubling of investments. 2010, a big jump again. And then what's expected for 2020 is what you're seeing is a, glo a growing global economy that is meeting with limited natural resources. And you'll hear countries like Germany and Denmark and others say, we want to be totally, completely petroleum independent, or we want to be completely, totally self-sustaining. Okay, so what is happening is companies now are starting to kind of cross that threshold into, okay, what's, what's been possible maybe scientifically and in the lab, we're starting to see how we can make money at it. And what you may not realize, I'm going to talk a little bit about cellulosic ethanol, is that there are a number of commercial cellulosic ethanol plants that are ramping up to commercial scale production this year. This is a huge year, a huge year for that industry. Okay, so here's another spaghetti model, but this is an analogous model for bio-based products. And the point is that all of those products that we could be getting 
or that we are getting from petroleum, from a barrel of oil, we could also get from biomass. And so Sunny mentioned some of the, the sugars, and yes, we know how to convert sugar, especially into ethanol. We've been doing that since we learned how to moonshine. You know, we've, we've been doing this a long time. Um, and there's you know, evidence for that in ancient civilizations too. Um, ethanol is a good thing. But maybe we can go farther than that. And converting sugar, pure sugar, like from, from starch is really pretty easy to digest. Like I tell my girls, when you eat corn, it's not really a vegetable, it's just little sugar balls, it doesn't count. So it's really easy to convert. Um, but getting at some of the uh, carbohydrates that are embedded in plant biomass is a little bit of a different story. Okay, so how are we making this transition using microbiology? I am a microbiologist, and as Ann mentioned, um, one of the ways that a lot of people are doing this is by harnessing the power of natural systems, and when those systems don't quite get us to where we need to be, using uh, microbial metabolic engineering to push us a little bit further to commercial level production. So I want to give you a couple of examples. And as I mentioned, I'm not an entomologist, but I'm fascinated by insects. They're truly amazing. And this is a, a digger wasp cocoon. And that number, that's a very large number. Anybody know what that number is? I had to look it up because I wasn't sure. It's 10 quintillion with a Q, quintillion. And that number is an estimate of the number of insects on the planet at any one time. So if everybody stopped wherever they were in the world and counted all the insects and there wasn't any overlap, the estimates are that there are 10 quintillion alive at any one time. That's a huge number, that's pretty amazing. But what's even more amazing maybe, if you do the math, is with every single one of those 10 quintillion, there's at least one microorganism associated with them, and sometimes hundreds of microorganisms associated with one insect. And insects are incredible. And what I'm showing you here with all the pretty colors is that this particular animal has evolved a way to attract bacteria that secrete antimicrobial compounds that cover its surface. So while it's immobilized in this cocoon, it doesn't get eaten by other things. So I thought that was pretty cool. And as Anne mentioned, most of us are familiar with the termites and the destruction that they cause. But they're amazing in their ability to transform the wood of their diet into fuel for themselves. And that could either be, uh, usually that results in more, more termite biomass, right? But they're intermediates. And they do that oftentimes with the help of their microbial consortia, and that's what's shown here. So sometimes it's protozoa, which are the big kind of fat looking sluggish little bit guys. Sometimes it's via bacteria, sometimes it's a combination of all three, and we're starting to unlock some of the secrets of the termite itself. The termite itself, tissue level synthesis, is contributing to degrading this biomass. Okay. So what, what can we learn from nature about some of these processes? And how do we take what nature does and then scale it up so that it makes sense for industry? And I, I'd like to finish up by giving you some examples. So as I mentioned, I'll talk about cellulosic ethanol, but many of the companies talk about cellulosic something else. So what they're talking about is using the entire plant material to make their product, not just the, the sugars like you would get from sugar cane or the starch from corn. Um, so you could use this process, um, the front end of it, you could make butanol, isobutanol, um, there are a whole bunch of different things. So just for um, the time's sake, I'm just going to stick with ethanol here. So whatever biomass you collect here, these happen to be pine trees, you have to grow it in a sustainable way, you have to harvest it, deliver it to wherever your processing plant is. Usually that material has to be either chopped up or shredded or somehow the particle size reduced so that you can get it into your equipment and the next step could take place so that the enzymes can digest those long chains of sugars. Okay, so we want to, to get at those long chains of sugars. Once you get to the sugars, then we have some really wonderful organisms that can ferment those sugars into ethanol, butanol, all sorts of products, and then you have to recover your product. So there's my, my commercial scenario. And I'd like to introduce you to one of my closest friends, 
This is Tapula abdominalis, and Tapula looks like a giant mosquito that will suck you dry of all of your blood. And they're found worldwide. They're big. They, they kind of look like they're drunken when they're flying. They're not very coordinated. Um, and I'm here to beg for mercy for them. Don't kill them. They don't have functional mouth parts as an adult. They can't bite you. They can't eat. They don't. They mate and lay eggs and die, and they live for one to four days like that. So if you see them, <laughs> don't kill them. And we study them in the larval stage, and this is what they look like as a, a larvae. And if you lop off either end and tug gently, um, of course, we sacrifice them. They give their, their lives. We try to do this humanely. Um, and you've got, they're all a gut here, pretty much. So the midgut's very alkaline, very high pH. Um, there's evidence for proteins being degraded, for phenolics uh, removed. Those are very toxic to fermenting organisms, usually. And then the hindgut is really packed full of microorganisms. And so we liken this natural bioreactor to the industrial process here, where the biomass is harvested by the animal, um, the particle size is reduced by its uh, voracious feeding. This animal is really important in stream, small headwater streams, where a lot of leaf litter and detritus falls into those ecosystems, and there's not a lot of sunlight. So if you look inside the animal, there's a wealth of information there. And, and you'll see this kind of story with lots and lots of animals. And people are taking a closer look again at cockroaches and even at termites. People have spent their entire career studying termites, and we're still discovering new things. So um, we were able to discover some novel enzymes for plant biomass degradation that, that hadn't been described in the literature before. And if you just look at a, a simplified diagram here where we have ethanol concentration and in the red, you'll see the amount of ethanol produced from this biomass using traditional yeast like you'd use for corn-based fermentations. And then um, we have an ethanol producing bacterium that can use all of the sugars in this biomass, some of the acidic sugars, some of the five carbon sugars. And then when we added these new enzymes with these um, novel activities, then we were able to increase the amount of ethanol substantially. And we just got really lucky with some of these enzymes because they happened to be secreted by our ethanol producing bacterium and they really um, allowed us to improve the process. Um, also, as you might imagine, when you look at a really complex ecosystem, there's going to be competition for living space because this animal gets about as big as your little finger and it's jam-packed full of microbes. So if you're the bacterium that secretes lots of antimicrobial compounds, then you're going to come out the winner, right, because you can kill off your competitors. And so what you're looking at here, this is one of the bacteria that we isolated and here are some of the other organisms trying to grow up to it and they can't because this one's producing something that's inhibiting them. And we actually do have a patent on this it's a new source of um, some antimicrobial compounds. And then sometimes you get really lucky and you can describe um, completely new organisms that's no, no one's seen before. And this particular organism, um, we have a, a picture of it here showing its cell wall, which you can't tell a whole lot about it, but that turned out to be really important because it has a, a novel cell wall type that no one had seen before. And it drove my students absolutely crazy because it's gram variable and pleomorphic. So if you're a microbiologist, you know what that means. <laughs> it means that sometimes it will stain one way, sometimes it'll be a rod, sometimes it'll be a different shape. And it took us a while to figure out, no, it wasn't contaminated, it was just this bizarre organism. So I um, also mentioned um, some detoxification that the insect does. And again, if I use pretreated pine, I'm, I'm, I'm from Georgia, and we have <laughs> lots of southern yellow pine there. And we know how to grow pine worldwide. It's harvested like a, a commodity for pulp and paper. It's been that way for, for decades. And the problem with, with softwoods like pine is that when you turn them into this soup that you're trying to get your organism to ferment, it's very toxic and usually things die, so your yields are very low. But So if you start out with the original yeast like you use for corn fermentations, you get this much ethanol down here with this green line. Um, we were able to improve a yeast, okay, got, got better, still kind of slow. And then with um, directed evolution and going back and doing quite a bit of sequencing and learning um, what, what we could do to further improve this situation, then we were able to increase the amount of ethanol um, quite a bit. And we think this has quite a bit of commercial potential. 
So that brings me to, okay, so that's great, all of you scientists in your research lab, you know, answering all these cool questions, getting to do all these fun things, but how does that translate into an industrially relevant process? Because we need to make money at this, we need to do it fast, and we need it yesterday. So there was a, a paper that was published by Jay Kiesling's group in Trends in Biotechnology in 2008, and I just love the title, and I've used it quite a bit. It's Pumping at the Microbial Well. And so what Jay was talking about in this paper is all the different metabolic pathways that could be manipulated in microorganisms in order for us to create a, a product and an industrial process to produce a product. So this was kind of a proof of principle paper, if you will, kind of a discussion. And so one of the companies that actually took this to heart is a company called Genomatica. And Genomatica produces as one of their products 1,4-butanediol. Um, and there is a market for BDO right now. It's in spandex, it's in tennis shoes, it's in car parts. And of course that's derived from crude oil and natural gas. So what they want to do is take biomass and directly produce uh, butane diol. They want to make the same exact chemical, they want to make it so that the uh, economics are better, that it has equivalent performance. So it's not a lesser than green thing, it's exactly the same replacements, the same chemical. And what they were able to do is they've engineered E. coli to produce 1,4-butane um, diol. And they did this um, as a proof of concept, and they were able to prove this concept in 2009. And then they were able to continually improve this pathway, and I think this organism has maybe 47, I think they told me, different changes to its metabolism. But they went from lab scale at 30 liters to a pilot plan in 2010 at 3,000 liters to a demo at 13,000 liters in 2011, and this year they partnered with DuPont, Tate, and Lyle to successfully produce 1,4-butane diol at commercial scale. So they went in a period of about five years to, okay, we can, we can prove this in principle, we can do this, and now we're commercially producing it. We were able to improve our rates that much. There are a number of other companies, I'll finish up by giving you a couple of examples, Meridian Bioplastics, their platform is the next generation renewable, biodegradable, non-petroleum polymers. So they don't make a specific end product, they don't make any of those plastic bags or any of this um, compostable and biodegradable stuff, but they grow the organisms using a fermentated process and they, they have these methods that they use to get the organisms to accumulate these storage molecules and then they, they convert these storage materials into the precursors for the bioplastics and then they send those to whichever company wants to make whatever the end product is. Um, Green Biologics, their platform is recommercializing the butanol fermentation and there are several companies that are going back to what existed several decades ago. Um, there used to be a very robust uh, butanol production and butanol acetone ethanol. Um, and with our new technologies and our new molecular tools, we're able to increase those yields, and there's a, a very strong market for, uh, for butanol. Um, one more example is Jivo. Their platform is isobutanol using a proprietary yeast, and they're wanting to convert this um, into drop-in fuels. And so right now they're using um, corn starch and sugar, just pure glucose. They'd like to be able to use biomass. And they say they're waiting for the cellulosic people to figure this part out and then they'll just incorporate the front end and, and make their isobutanol. So I, I see this happening and I get phone calls from people saying, okay, well, do you have anybody graduating? Do you know anybody who has fermentation experience? You know, who do you know who can do this? And if this, economy is really transitioning away from petroleum and I think it is, I think we're serious about this. Because if you think about all those powerful drivers that have aligned, the political, the environmental, and then the money, I mean come on, if we don't do this now then we're, we're just really ignoring a very powerful wake-up call. So, so I, think, I think it's going to happen. I think, I think I can. I think we're doing it. I think we're going to move forward. So what we developed was this um, 
training program on um, industry relevant equipment and ours is, is a professional science master so the students actually uh, take business classes with MBA students so they know how to manage a project they know how to manage a team they know how to speak to their higher ups in a language that they can understand too in addition to hitting the ground running when they start their internship so the last thing uh, maybe I'd like to leave you with is how, how important it is for us to all be on board, how important it is for us to educate ourselves constantly and start really early. And this is um, my colleague, Dr. Anna Carl right here. And she's developed this um, traveling show that we do sometimes where we actually will take the termites, live termites out into schools and different places. And we did the, the science fair um, here last year in Washington. But the, the kids just get, get really jazzed, don't they? by dissecting out the, the termites and they actually get to see the, the video that I showed you on the, on the microscope. And this is, these are my girls here visiting with, do you know who that is? Can you tell? Yes, yeah, that's yes, President Carter. So if you think back to when he was president, I mean, he was talking about cellulosic biofuels way back in the day, uh, way before his time. And I've learned so much from him in how to persevere through adversity and how to stick to something that's a good idea and how to never give up. That man is probably more active today than he was, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. It's incredible. But, um, but I'll stop here and thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Can I ask both of you to come up? And, uh, and we'll start. I, I'm going to, I love the way Joy talks. So I'm going to say, <laughs> do all y'all have any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we have uh, we can have questions in the room, and then we um, also have online guests who can send in questions. Or uh, and we have a place for Twitter questions, so we'll try to alternate. I have a question. I would like to hear more about potential funding opportunities. If there's anything that you could share about the the vision for where you see. Yeah. So uh, is this on? Yeah. Okay. All right. So the question uh, is was about uh, what sort of funding opportunities do we have available? And as I said, as I closed up there earlier, uh, we have been proposed to receive three hundred eighty-three million dollars in our uh, AFRI, pro the Agriculture and Food Research Initiative program, which is our star uh, flagship program. The uh, you know, as the saying goes here in Washington D.C., the president proposes and Congress disposes, and uh, we had a really good hearing with, on the on Capitol Hill as well here about a month ago, and I'm very hopeful. In fact, uh, some of your representatives from the state of Georgia were on the uh, uh, in the hearing as well. They're very supportive, and I'm hoping that we're indeed going to be able to get. Uh, all of the $383 million that we've asked for. So this 2013 year, we're at $275 million. For 2014, we've been proposed to receive 383. I'm hoping it's gonna fall someplace in between, preferably closer to the 383. And uh, in terms of the priorities that we've got, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the traditional priorities we've got, of course, we wanna invest funding in uh, climate change. We wanna make investments in bioenergy. We want to make investments in uh, food security. We want to make investments in food safety. We want to make investments in childhood obesity and nutrition. And uh, also we want to make investments in uh, agricultural economics and rural, rural communities. So the first five top four topic, five topics actually are apropos for microbiologists and every one of those will have the op uh, you know for people to apply to and and uh, as i said ann lichens park who's sitting here she is one of my national program leaders and uh, uh, she can share a lot more information about this but we're hoping that uh, as we go forward we're going to be i think as we go forward we're going to be oh the other area that we're proposing to do is water uh, as, a, as a new challenge area. And we've not really invested quite a lot of money in the water area. Uh, 
in a purposeful manner. So we are proposing to invest in water as well. And uh, so for specifically for microbiologists, I would encourage you to look at what we're you know wanting to do in the realm of bioenergy and food safety right off the top, but also in the realm of uh, um, food security as well, because. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, work we're earlier discussing, uh, the need for this transformative approaches to looking at uh, uh, nitrogen fixation as a as a means to go forward. I think we've kind of hit the wall, to use Anne's uh, uh, terminology here. We've hit the wall and we've not been able to go beyond that. So uh, uh, you'll start seeing a lot, you know, our RFAs as they come out here in the next uh, year, two years, three years, four years, you see a lot more of the push to try to get the uh, the, the game-changing sorts of uh, uh, discoveries to be made as well. And, and really, I mean, you know, uh, uh, in, in terms of joy shared with you the kinds of things that are possible um, you know using entomological ex uh, examples in terms of uh, tapula and termites and things like that they also you know all manner of organisms particularly microbes produce uh, some an amazing array of uh, chemistries and I hope that as we go forward we're going to really be investing money in the bioeconomy more broadly as well it might very well be become part of our effort to seek funding for 2015 as a, a a priority for us. Thank you. Could you, you stand? Could you use the microphone, please, so that people online can hear you? What do you see as some of the uh, most compelling uh, technical challenges to achieving an economical uh, uh, bio-based uh, economy, uh, specifically in producing feedstock, for example, for uh, Chemicals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know. Uh I said I'm an entomologist and have been an administrator, and now I'm in the position that I'm in. So it doesn't make me an expert in any, uh, in any of these things that uh, that you're asking me to respond to. But I think really, when you look at when you scan the uh, landscape, as it were, um, I talked about the opportunity to have these game-changing abilities to get uh, nitrogen fixation into monocotyledonous plants, for example. If we understand how dicotyledonous plants are doing this, particularly legumes, then how do we get that knowledge? into monocotyledonous plants. I think there's a, a great opportunity to, uh, if we were be able to be able to do that, that's going to be one heck of a game changer for us, particularly in relation to climate change, for example, particularly in relation to the amount of nitrogen fertilizer we use as well. Another area that, of, uh, of that we need this sort of a game-changing, transformative uh, discoveries to be made is in the realm of C4 and C3 photosynthesis. And for those of you that don't know what that is, C4 photosynthesis, uh, you find that sort of a photosynthetic uh, ability in uh, corn and, and sorghum and other plants, other species, and C3 you find in rice. And C4 plants, C4 photosynthetic plants, can produce about two times as much photosynthate for the same amount of uh, inputs, for the same amount of oxygen, carbon, uh, water and, and energy and other things, okay? So two times as much. So imagine if you can take that knowledge and then get it incorporated into rice and the kinds of things that could happen that uh, rice again, rice production systems, particularly in Asia, for example, are, uh, uh, you know, it's an anaerobic uh, condition in which rice is grown in the paddies and that's producing a lot of methane as well that's contributing to uh, climate change. So there's a couple of areas that I think we really need, desperately need some work to be done. And the other parts of it are really, you know, in terms of uh, uh, the, the realization of the promise of the omics revolution itself, I think we've just barely scratched the surface. A fourth area, truly, in my mind, is going to be in the integrative physiology areas as well, of, of plants, animals, microbes, and other things. And I could go on and on for a long time, but I do want to stop right there. Shannon, do we have any questions from the cloud? Uh, we do, actually. We have a question from the chat room. So we've been talking a lot about um, the bioeconomy and how it could be developed in the United States. But how do you envision these types of industries taking off in developing countries? I'm going to let Joy and so then I can respond to it. Okay. Um, well, I can give a very limited worldview <laughs> of some of this, uh, just because of some of the collaborations we have. Um, sometimes necessity is the greatest push for you to figure out how to do something, right? 
the mother of invention. And so we, I, I guess in certain areas of the world, like we, we have a project um, with uh, the country Colombia with the, the coffee farmers and they have a lot of mucilage and they have a lot of material that's left during coffee processing and they're looking for an added value to something that they already do so that it pays them more money to grow the crop that they need to grow instead of a drug. So, so for many countries, um, there's already kind of a, a niche that if you could just provide an answer to a problem or a challenge that they already have, that's the low-hanging fruit. And that's, that's where I think people are gravitating toward. So uh, to add to that, we did, uh, uh, one of my colleagues in my agency, Viandette Lopez, uh, she, I asked her to look at the entire landscape of the world. And uh, so she looked at Europe, the European Union, she looked at the United States, Canada, and uh, Japan. And then along with that, she also looked at Brazil, South Africa, India, and China. And then she pooled all of the other countries in Latin America as one pool, as it were. And uh, I think, you know, when you look at it, the kind of investments that are being made in the in the realm of the bioeconomy in these countries like India, Brazil, China, South Africa, it's unbelievable investments that are being made, in part because these countries are also not blessed, in quotes, with the fossil fuels. Although, you know, this fracking business and, uh, um, uh, methane hydrates that are in the uh, oceans, you know, this is going to be a, a game changer. This article that uh, Joy was referring to in the Atlantic, if you get a chance, you might want to read that about these uh, uh, methane hydrates. Uh, it's going to result in countries like uh, China and India and many of the poor countries around the world that have a coastal location. They're going to all become self-sufficient in their energy needs. And that's going to have a very huge impact on what we do in terms of the investments that we make as well in the bioeconomy. So because currently they're not blessed with fossil fuels, they're thinking that they're gonna be able to leapfrog in terms of the technologies. In fact, if you look at the, the analogy is the telephone systems, you know. We had here in the United States, we had wired telephone systems that took many, many, many decades and then we got wireless technologies and then now we've got everybody around, you know, walks around with smartphones and other cell phones and many of us have given up on landlines. What has happened in Africa and uh, South America and Asia and in the poor countries is they've leapfrogged onto uh, mobile technology as it were. And and that's a pretty good uh, a metaphor for the kinds of things that are going on in, in the bioeconomy as well. I think uh, many of the poorer countries are actually seeing the possibilities in terms of the bioeconomy, particularly if they can figure out how to capitalize on the resources that they've got. And, and countries like Costa Rica and others are an exemplar for us uh, when we're thinking of the bioeconomy itself. They're, they're mining their microbes and their plants and their trees and their insects and other organisms and, and actually mining them for various types of uh, compounds of interest as well. Um, I have a question regarding the bioeconomy, national security, environmentalism. Um, there's been a lot of concerns about the bioeconomy and biofuels especially because of displacement of agriculture, food production. Um, however, I don't know, uh, in the Oregon wheat genetically engineered uh, controversy that's come out last week with Monsanto, uh, I heard of one of the uh, sound bites of the farmer saying that 90% of the wheat that was being produced is actually for export. So, and if this is an issue of, of national security and not, you know, not exporting our food that we're or growing so much, do you think that there's a, a policy or a place that this issue of displacing agriculture for American uh, national security. Um, there's a rule that if we publicize that 90% of our food or that wheat is being exported, um, therefore no gain for the Amer for the American national security per se. Um, that we could overcome this issue of agriculture being displaced or this this concept of agriculture being displaced for the for the needs of the bioeconomy. So do you want to take that on? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so it, it's actually a very complicated uh, response to the question that you asked. In fact, the export of agricultural commodities does in many ways ensure our national security as well. 
So the, uh, ex you know, we have about $130 billion worth of agricultural commodities that we export. That doesn't take into account the uh, forestry commodities, just the agricultural commodities. This would be milk and milk products, fruit and vegetables and products, uh, various types of grains and products, on and on and on, uh, that, you know, craft foods and general mills and others are also exporting, like, you know, uh, uh, cornflakes and things like that. So imagine all of these are part of the agricultural, the bioeconomy that we're exporting. And what I'm talking about, the $130 billion in exports, uh, is only the bulk commodities that are being exported. It doesn't even include what's happening in the realm of what uh, General Mills and Kraft Foods and all do. So it is part of our, of our economic well-being, of our national security as well. Secondly, the 90% uh, term that was used is 90% of the wheat that is grown in the Pacific Northwest that gets exported, not in the rest of the United States. So in the rest of the United States, Kansas, Texas, you know, in the, the Great Plains states, we grow a lot of wheat. In fact, Kansas is called the wheat state in, in many ways. Used to be about 11 million acres of wheat that was grown in Kansas. is now down to about six and a half, seven million acres of uh, wheat. But what they're to referring to specifically is the Pacific Northwest itself. So we do keep a lot of the wheat here in the United States. Wheat, uh, for the most part, is consumed by humans, unlike corn and, and soybeans and things like that, which end up being uh, 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 in livestock feed. Do we have another online question, Shannon? Uh, we do, actually. So we have a question um, whether taking agricultural and forestry waste um, and using that to transform it into commodity chemicals is economically feasible, and if not yet, what sort of major hurdles do we need to overcome to make it so? I'll start, okay, I'll start to address that one. Um, in some instances, some agricultural residues or co-products are economically viable. For example, some of the, the larger um, corn ethanol producers now actually have another process where they've figured out how to um, take enough corn stover off the fields and then leave enough so that there's still um, enough fertilizer, enough um, protection of the soil, you know, to prevent erosion. And they're, they're kind of building on cellulosic in addition to the corn ethanol. Um, so, so they don't really like to think of that as a waste product. It's a, you know, a co-product or a residue. Um, with sugar beet pulp, uh, a lot of the pulp is dehydrated and pelletized and then it's exported. Um, you could actually use a lot of that pulp if you have the right organism to produce additional ethanol and then go ahead and save your sugar for the, the table sugar for sucrose. Um, for forestry residues, it's more complicated because of the collection and the hauling. Um, but there are people out there who are trying to figure out how much would it cost to also take the treetops and the limbs and some of the unmerchantable timber and convert that. But if you're trying to, to build a hundred million gallon ethanol plant or, or something very large comparable to a large corn ethanol plant, the economics are, are difficult because of the transportation costs. So. Can we get the next question? So I've got a, a somewhat related question. So how are we doing in terms of our efficiencies and, and identifying which crops are the best for converting into, you know, taking biomass and converting into biofuels? And uh, also uh, another question would be uh, in terms of, you, you showed in your presentation a, a five-step cellulosic ethanol process. How good are we doing at, at converting that into like a, a four-step process? Uh, well, in, in some instances, uh, people are commercializing this, and it depends on, that's why the, the plants are located in strategic areas of the world, and it's close to the biomass, because you don't want to have to haul it. You want to be able to use the water that's in the biomass and not transport it very far. Um, there are commercial cellulosic, um, using wheat straw, using rice hulls, using um, corn stover, um, sugar cane bagasse, and some of that, there still usually is some kind of pretreatment. There's some kind of chemical and chopping usually that's required. Um, there are processes where the enzymes and the organisms are together in one pot, the simultaneous securification fermentation or SSF. So I guess you could consider that one, one pot. There's not a fast way to get an organism and a biomass and get to a product without another intermediate step in there yet. 
people are working on it and it will happen but it's really slow but you should look at the renewable fuels association site because there's a report out that that gives you a snapshot of all of the cellulosic plants and where they started their timeline and where they are now and it's, it's really eye-opening because I don't think people realize how many are coming on commercial commercial level now so there was an article in the New York Times today talking or emphasizing the need for um, new antibiotics against superbugs Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you knew the mode of action on your antibiotic that you showed on the slide and what it's efficacious against. This, this particular one I chose on this slide um, wasn't, it turned out not to be a new antibiotic, it's just a new source for the antibiotic. So this is one of the, the group of polymyxins. So, but, but the idea is that where you look very closely at um, populations of microorganisms that haven't been dis really described in detail that with the new tools that we have, what the likelihood of finding something really new is there. So, so we're always looking. But, yeah. um, we had a couple of questions actually from a uh, microbiology teacher at the undergraduate level and she was wondering if you could sum up in one sentence um, why would it be important for her students to study microbiology and get involved in the bioeconomy? One word, jobs. <laughs> there you go. They George, touch you have everything. A up? <laughs> well, I have a sentence. They touch everything and they rule the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this particular professor also had a follow up question. Um, what graduate programs should she recommend her students go into if they're interested in pursuing these careers? These careers in the bioeconomy? Mm -hmm. It, it depends on where they see themselves. You know, there are traditional masters or traditional PhD programs that are related to everything. You, I mean, you mentioned agriculture, you mentioned plant science, you know, plant genetics, microbiology, all the omics, bioinformatics. Depends on where their their particular passion lies. So uh, I would add to that, you know, uh, particularly in the in the area of food process engineering. There's unbelievable opportunities available if they went on to graduate school and, and uh, on beyond that. Many, many fantastic jobs available. A lot of students, what they end up doing is they think, particularly as they go to graduate school and then get a PhD, they think they're all going to become professors, you know. There aren't very many positions available within academia. And where you've got the opportunity is really in, in the private sector amazing opportunities in the private sector. Not even in the federal government. In fact, you know, the federal government were, you know, scrunching down, as you know. And uh, a lot of students, you know, they kind of look down upon the private sector, but I think you can have a very fulfilling career even in the private sector. You can make great discoveries, you can contribute to societal well-being, and uh, you can earn a pretty decent living as well. And just to add to that, one thing that I found really fun is is when students learn about what all microorganisms do and what some potential jobs are that like we bring people in from industry and we, we say, you know, how did you get to where you are and what kind of jobs does your company have? And it's always, I had no idea, I had no idea. They just have, have no idea, like you illustrated in the beginning. They just had no clue that these kinds of things existed. So I would tell that teacher, at least open their eyes to the possibilities because we don't do a very good job in high school. Most high schools. Maybe we have time for one more quick question. If there aren't any, I would just like to put in a plug for a couple of reports that are going to be coming out of the American Academy of Microbiology. One of the programs that we have uh, at the Academy is called the Colloquium Program. There's several of our reports are out on the table. We've had two colloquia in the last six months related to this topic. The first one was called How Microbes Can Help Feed the World. And that was focused on the end of the microbial spectrum of possibilities where all plants are dependent on a community of microbes to help them find nutrients, to help defend them against insects and pathogens and grazing animals. Um, they use microbes to protect their seeds from predators and from other bacteria. And if we could harness the power of microbes to help plants grow in poor soil, to grow when there's a drought, to grow when the climate 
uh, for the area where that plant normally grows is changing. Tremendous opportunities for increasing agricultural productivity, which then feeds into this area of how do we use that new sustainable high production of agricultural products to, to have even more value added. So the second colloquium, which was actually chaired by Joy, uh, was called Training the Microbiologist of the Future, and that, that's going to deal with this chicken and egg problem of there aren't any programs or very few programs in schools that students can arrive their freshman year and say, oh, I want to be in that program. Um, and on the other hand, the, the, because the schools haven't started them and the schools haven't started them because they don't have demand from students. So how do you get this going where you start saying it's worth investing in a program to train students to do microbiology for these for non-biomedical purposes? Um, how do you get those programs going? How do you let students know that those are available? So those two reports will be coming out probably in the next three to four months. So keep an eye on the American Society for Microbiology's website for those reports. And our next Microbes After Hours will be on July 8th. Um, Shannon, you want to give a little introduction to what that topic is going to be? Sure. Um, we have a really exciting um, program planned for you guys um, in about a month from now. Um, this title of uh, this particular Microbes After Hours is called Shutting Down the Government. Um, we have two talks on different microbiology episodes that have actually brought the U.S. government to the halt. Um, so the first one is going to be talking about a yellow fever outbreak in Philadelphia in 1793 when the U.S. government was actually still um, housed in Philadelphia. And this major outbreak actually shut down um, the U.S. government. So we're going to have a speaker um, from the NIH, uh, Marshall Bloom is going to be talking about that. And then as a follow-up, we'll be having something that was a little bit more recent. Um, we're going to talk about Amerithrax. So we're going to have someone from the FBI um, talking about um, the anthrax letters that were sent and a little bit about the bioforensics and tracking down where these strains came from. So we hope we'll see you all again on July 8th. Bring your friends. And um, we're very uh, glad that we could uh, host you here tonight and uh, if you're not a member of ASM there's a membership table please join us because we have a great message to give the world that microbes really have the potential to uh, improve life on lots of levels um, they're not just bad guys J July 8th to the contrary sometimes <laughs> they are bad guys <laughs> but thank you all very much for coming and let's thank our speakers one more time BSL4 space, the only way you can get out is to go through a chemical shop. It's an unusual room, never seen anything like this. Anybody who has access to this facility first has to go through an R scan. The HEPA filters filter the air coming out of the facility and that will remove bacteria, viruses, anything that might constitute any kind of risk, right? Remember this building is, is basically a second building inside the main building.